Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, after I was invited to speak today, I contemplated about what my topic should be. You always want broad appeal when you speak publicly, perhaps something about what I do for a living, maybe the questions surrounding the Orioles starting rotation, or the issues along the Ravens offensive line, or a 40 minute discussion about the history of Baltimore sports, or something that uniquely interests me, that ever changing landscape in electronic media, and the role you all will have in shaping that landscape. But I opted to talk about something that connects all of us, and that something is Gilman. I should say now that I will have plenty of time afterwards to take questions on any of those subjects I just mentioned or whatever else is on your mind. When alums return to Gilman, I know a lot of speeches begin with, I stood up here X number of years ago. So to stick with that theme, for me, it was about 11 years ago, shortly before graduation, when I stood up on that stage to present my senior speech, in which I spoke about my personal journey at Gilman. As is customary, I began by saying something like this. Mr. Smythe, Mrs. Turner, faculty and students, thank you so much for inviting me here today. It means so much to come back. This school will always be a home for me. At the time of my senior speech, with graduation soon to follow, I regarded my graduation as one of the greatest achievements in my life. Some of you may be thinking, graduating from high school, you must be living some kind of life as one of your greatest achievements. But for me, it was not an easy feat. School was a major challenge. For my parents who are in the audience, and for some members of the Gilman faculty here, I think they can attest that it was in fact quite difficult. You may be wondering, why was it such a challenge? Because I have a learning disability, dyslexia, that combined with the rigorous curriculum that is Gilman's hallmark, and the demands of keeping up with the high academic standards, it was very difficult. So what is dyslexia? Well, it has nothing to do with intelligence, but everything to do with the ability to read. It is a reading disorder where the brain has a hard time recognizing and processing certain symbols. So things that came easily to others did not come easily to me. And for a great chunk of my time here, I was able to survive and advance, content with just getting by, class by class, and grade by grade. I was also content with wallowing in self-pity and angry about my disadvantages at Gilman and in my life. During my time at Gilman, we tried dozens of strategies to help me become a better student, ranging from tutors to books on tape. It was a humbling day when I ordered a book on tape and it arrived in an envelope marked Reading for the Blind and Dyslexic. <laughs> there was struggling with reading and writing English in middle school and we're being taught Spanish and Latin. You can imagine the frustration. It's not that I didn't have my passions, skills, talents, and intelligence. I did, and I don't mind saying so. It was about finding a way to transform those passions, skills, talents into success. Eventually, I realized that to find my way, it was time to start getting angry at the right thing, not at the learning disability with which I was born, but at myself for letting it define me and for causing me to waste this precious and fleeting opportunity that Gilman provides to its students. Yes, dyslexia is a disadvantage in my life, but it's actually laughable. It's actually laughable for me to use the words disadvantage and my life in the same sentence. I have actually been blessed 10,000 times over in my life. I'm very biased, but I have the best parents in the world. They are to me inspiring examples of how to live your life. Their emphasis is on family and friends and hard work. They, of course, always cared deeply about my education, and they decided to send me here to Gilman starting in first grade. They are here, when I, they were here when I gave my senior speech back in 2003, and they're here today in 2014. Also, I have wonderful siblings, and I'm delighted that my brother, Craig, happens to be in today from New York, and he chose to attend today. My incredible wife, Erin, is here, who's a teacher down the street, actually at Calvert. But I digress, I'm making a point about the blessings in my life, and I shouldn't leave this out. I've known since I was about seven years old what I wanted to do with my life. Ever since I could remember, I always wanted to be a broadcaster. Now, I don't recommend that you become dead set on a particular vocational path at a very young age. You may say now, I want to be a doctor, a lawyer, a, a broadcaster, and find out that it's not for you. But for me, there was nothing else. My passion never wavered. 
At the age of seven, I started calling the play-by-play -play for games in my parents' bedroom using an old tape recorder. I put the TV on and turned the sound down, and then I played it back so I could improve. I interned in radio at the age of 15, when interns could actually work at that age. So despite the occasional C or worse, there was never a doubt about what I wanted to do, but I needed to find my way. This is where the support and encouragement of this incredible institution comes into the story. About my sophomore year of high school, I asked a classmate of mine, Scott Kidder, who is now near the top, and not surprisingly so, of one of the top web companies in the world called Gawker. I told Scott that I thought I could do play-by-play -play for Gilman basketball on our student-run radio station, G94.3. At that time, G94.3 had never broadcast a student athletic event before. It really only did music, and that was uh, very loose at the time. Uh, of course, we needed approval from the administration. We begged and we begged. Scott figured out the technical side, and I organized the broadcast, and we got approval. And this may only happen at a place like Gilman, the perfect marriage between motivated students, some imagination, and a trusting faculty. Broadcasting games that could be heard in the lunchroom and the Finney Athletic Center was, at the time, a big deal. But for us, it was not the finish line. I told Scott about this new craze, something as crazy as streaming a sports broadcast on the internet. By this point, we were just juniors, and our challenge really began. We need the trust and the confidence from the headmaster and others on down that I could represent Gilman to the outside world without embarrassing the school. Easier said than done, I think, for many of us who were once sitting over there. And we also needed advertising money to pay for the internet company we were going to use, plus better equipment. Thankfully, we had the genius of Scott Kidder on the technical front to figure that out, but we needed the green light from Gilman, and we got it. I arranged for a team of classmates to get involved, spotting for me at the games, keeping the stats. I had a rotating list of color commentators for each broadcast to involve the most students possible. It became, believe it or not, a big deal on campus. Students, parents, faculty, and alums were all talking about it. Long story short, by senior year, we did football, basketball, and lacrosse year round. I think three local publications did articles about us, including a front page story in the Baltimore Sun sports section. And I think we had over 5,000 listeners for an MIAA semifinal lacrosse game in Homewood Field. By the way, when this effort began, my grades also improved and my days of self-pity were over. I don't want to bore you with my whole life story and I'll be happy to answer your questions again at the end, but to the extent that I enjoy any career success, I will always be thankful to Gilman for helping me along the way. So to flash forward to what I do now, I work nearby at WBAL where I wear many hats. Mainly I host a radio program that starts at 6.05 p.m. weekdays called Sportsline. A shameless plug here, please check it out. It's also available on WBAL.com, our WBAL.com iPhone app, and also 97.9 HD4 if you have HD radio. I don't know what happened there, but sorry about that. Uh, but back to the show Sportsline, it has a story history and we believe it is the longest running sports talk show in America and I've been the host for the last four years. I also appear on WBAL-TV and 98 Rock, and inside the building there's very little they don't throw my way. Specifically, I cover the Orioles and Ravens very closely. WBAL is the radio flagship for both teams. And I cover sports in our area and beyond. I've already had the opportunity to cover a Super Bowl where I travel with the Ravens on the team plane, as well as the Major League Baseball playoffs where I did my pregame show from the field at Yankee Stadium and live from the finish line every year at the Preakness Stakes. I was also on the field when Ray Lewis did his final dance at MT Bank Stadium, and when the Ravens made their trip to the White House last year, I was there. I've interviewed senators, governors, best-selling authors, and entertainers, and local sports icons from Buck Showalter to John Harbaugh to Frank Robinson. And for a youngster who had trouble reading, it's a bit ironic that I now get paid to read commercials live on the radio. And it's quite satisfying that when I'm doing television, I'm reading live off of a teleprompter to thousands. So I think it's fair to say that I've come a long way. Now here is a little post-college advice. It's not as simple as landing at my dream job at 25 and the place where I actually interned 10 years earlier for the same show that I now host. Life and careers are difficult and hard to navigate. Hard work is essential, 
and there's a lot of luck involved. But every student sitting here right now has a distinct advantage moving forward, moving forward in all phases of life to come, college, career, family. The advantage is Gilman. But Gilman is not a guarantee of success. You need to make it happen for yourself. I hope I don't create any sleepless nights here for students who thought that by virtue of having a Gilman diploma, they are guaranteed all the good things in life. That is not how it works. You will learn that out there, out there in the so-called real world, that the Gilman advantage is not the diploma. It's something more abstract than that. It's the quality of the education that goes on here. It's the subjects that are being taught by committed teachers who aim tirelessly to motivate, encourage, and inspire you and actually care about you as individuals. It's the process of learning, how to think critically and not just memorize, but actually think. It's about being a self-starter, taking the initiative and not giving up because you didn't succeed the first time or because you weren't good at something naturally. It's your fellow students who are so smart and motivated, they force you to rise to their level. It's the lasting friendships that you form here. I got married last summer, and six Gilman classmates were in my wedding. Another 20 were in attendance, friends that I will cherish for the rest of my life. Gilman also provides an opportunity to dream big. Broadcasting games almost 15 years ago on the campus radio station and on the internet is something I don't think was likely going to happen anywhere else but here. At almost any other school, it would have been dismissed. Not feasible, too hard, too difficult, too challenging, but not here. Gilman to me is also about values and how everyone should conduct themselves in the world beyond these walls. I was privileged to have a legendary first grade teacher here, Mrs. Betsy McDonald, who embodied the values of this institution. She cared so deeply about the character of the students she taught and was devoted to both the kids and the school. She actually came to our five-year reunion at the Mount Washington Tavern, Tavern some 17 years after we left her class. What did she teach us in first grade? About being a Gilman boy? Integrity, honor, humility, and most importantly, most importantly, how you treat others. If those principles are the only thing you take away from your time here, then your time was not wasted. And beyond the obvious learning that happened for me at Gilman, little did I know at the time, but the seeds of becoming a talk show host were planted here. In the lower school, after every, and I mean every heartbreaking Orioles loss, the problems surrounding the team were vigorously, if not hotly debated during recess. As a freshman, Mrs. Turner's son, Dr. Andy Martiri, would meet with a handful of students every day for lunch in 010, I believe. That's low round, right? 010? For, uh, we met for lunch, and we make a list of, the, list of the pressing sports topics of the day, go back and forth, and debate each one. Now, we called it the forum, but I'm pretty sure we had a mole from ESPN in our group because a few years later, ESPN launched a program called PTI, or Pardon the Interruption, which was and still is identical to what we did during lunchtime. Another example was any Dr. Thornberry-led history class. If you had a point to make in class, you better research it, and you better know your facts, and then you better back it up. Great training for what I do and how I prepare now for three hours every night. I'll end with these points, and students heed this warning. This doesn't last forever. Enjoy every moment, and learn as much as you can during your time here and find your personal broadcast, whatever that may be, but take, adva take advantage of every day here because it's such a wonderful opportunity and a privilege to attend a school like Gilman. And this might be the tackiest thing ever done in the history of speech making, but I'll quote myself in my senior speech 11 years ago <laughs> to bring this full circle. And this is actually a quote from a cotton lecturer I heard my senior year uh, sitting in those seats you're in right now. And this quote, I still carry with me to this day, interestingly enough, that you can get straight A's in high school and fail out of life, and you can fail out of high school and get straight A's in life. I love that quote. And that quote continues to resonate with me every time I hear it. Thank you all so much, and again, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Dr. Thornberry, I thought you'd be first. I got to say three things about our speaker. <laughs> One, 
He's the only student I've had at Gilman School who argued with me for uh, a semester that he should be in U.S. since 45. I said, Fred, let's take American government your senior year. I, we don't want to load your plate with too much. He argued, uh, he argued all first semester, and lo and behold, he's in U.S. since 45 second semester. That's the first point. So he, he's a two-time loser. He had me in the uh, <laughs> second semester of senior year. And somebody turned the clock back uh, because he didn't know it was second semester of his senior year. Okay, that's one. Two. At the end of his senior year, he won an all city contest. It might have been an all state contest. Do you know the, uh, the case? Yeah, Gideon versus Wainwright, right? Uh, he wrote the best paper on the impact of Gideon versus Wainwright. I was down there. I got elbowed out by his mother so she'd be closer to him. <laughs> but I was down there in June when he got the award. Three, you heard the sad tale of ad academic woe. Early decision, Dickinson College. Start your take that. <laughs> great example of when things just kind of work and it marinates and it finally clicks in but I actually was a political science major at Dickinson College and a history minor and although there was no communications program there no journalism program there uh, you know I wrote for the school paper broadcasting games year around but one of my real passions is the stuff that I learned with Dr. Thornberry and uh, anything history or political related here at Gilman and Dr. Thornberry I think even though we did argue a lot, uh, was keenly aware of this. And one day, I believe we got permission, Dr. Thornberry, and you thought I'd like this movie. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, you took me to see, in the name of the father, playing the Charles. Right. Playing the Charles, and uh, Governor Ehrlich was the keynote speaker before the movie, and you thought that was very ironic for the movie, if anyone's ever seen it, that uh, Governor Ehrlich was, this is, I don't want to bore everyone too much, but really post 9 11 stuff. But it's a Daniel Day Lewis movie, and I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. But uh, Dr. Thornberry pulled me uh, out of class, we got permission, we went to see that. Getting the fact that it was about what we were learning, and I would appreciate the movie so much, and I got to meet the governor, so it was really win, win, win. Yeah, sure. Um, well, at the time I got here, actually, it was something <laughs> about the Gilman Radio Program, and it's interesting. I had heard about it when I was in middle school, and again, I really knew what I wanted to do with my life, and I wrote a letter when I was in middle school to the person I heard was running here in upper, upper school at the time, and I actually wrote a letter about doing games at Gilman when I was like 12 or 13 years old, and the, the senior running it said it was a club that, you know, we, we just don't have the equipment. I wouldn't even know where to begin with that. He was a great guy, but answered my question honestly and candidly and said it's just not feasible at this time. So a couple years go by, and my friend Scott Kidder, who again is just a technical whiz, but he's just a very bright guy, and once he became the head of it and had these bigger dreams of what it could become, at the time it simply played music, but he started a marketing campaign for the station. He had this bigger vision. I started thinking, well, what could be here? So we got together, we sketched out a plan of doing these games, and he was able to figure out everything from the budgeting for it to the technical components. And then once we were able to get faculty and uh, administration approval, we moved forward into calling games. And I remember doing the first game of Gilman basketball. It was really basic stuff as far as what we know now technically. But we did the game, and I got the tapes, and then I sent them to uh, Coach Jordan, I sent them to Mr. Schmick, I'm sure Mrs. Turner, and they were like, all right, we can take the next step here. But I had to cross one bridge at a time, and when I left here, we were doing four sports year-round, or three sports, I should say, year-round, and then I know in the years after I left, when I, while I was in college, swimming was being done, water polo was being done, on the campus radio station and on the internet. And then after I, I left Gilman, it became a huge boom as far as the industry is concerned. Major League Baseball makes about a billion dollars a year putting their games on the internet. We're not quite at that level here, but a lot of area schools were doing it. And then every college, D1 to D3, puts all their games on the internet. It became a thing. And I'd like to say here we were kind of out in front of it. Yes? Uh, 
on a day work in June. Um, I know that there's a lot of broadcasting stuff that started with like Virginia. I was wondering if you had any uh, issue with that and the correlation between new media and like that kind of old thing. You're talking about print and the new media? Well, here's what I'll say about that. The lines are blurred. You can talk to a blogger who writes about the Orioles, and he's also doing television and radio. It's very hard to separate it all out now. You have to be a chameleon if you want to make it in sports media nowadays. Very few people are just one thing, unless you're so talented and you're so good, and they say, hey, just worry about the broadcast. Just worry about the paper the next day. But you have to be so far out in front of it because uh, what's the media landscape going to look like in five years, tomorrow, 20 years? Will there be newspapers? Where, will, how will we profit off any of this new media? They, it all looks and sounds good, but how will anyone make money off of it? So you kind of need to do everything. If you want to get into this field, you have to be ready, willing, able to just get your foot in the door, and then, uh, again, kind of be able to do everything. You can have a focus that I want to be a journalist, in print media or online, but realistically, uh, for you to branch out, you're going to have to do a lot more than that. And that's, uh, it, you guys will have a better beat on this than I will. If I could predict what the landscape will look like tomorrow, uh, I'd be in really good shape right now. But it's really hard. I mean, I'm in a business, AM radio, which has been around for a very, very long time, and they keep saying it's, uh, it's on its last day, will it be here tomorrow, and it somehow survives and continues. But again, even for, for me, I'm, I do television, AM and FM radio for one company, and uh, occasionally I'll write a blog or an article. They keep me very active on Twitter uh, and, and any other way we can reach out to a new audience or one more person. And that's kind of the way it needs to be. Yes, in the back. Yeah, I'm Will Sherman, I'm a senior. I just wanted to hear your take on Ubaldo Jimenez, whether you can turn it around or what. what I sure hope so. Four years, 50 million bucks. A question about Ubaldo Jimenez. Rough start, rough start, uh, and he is a notorious slow starter, I will say that, but this is a guy who no one's ever questioned his overall talents and ability, his velocity was good in New York the other day. Um, he couldn't get over his secondary stuff, but uh, he's gotta get better. He's not going anywhere. He'll run him out there every five days because the Orioles did something that's unprecedented for them, which is give someone, or give a starting pitcher four years. So. He's going to be out there. He's going to be exactly what he was over the last few seasons. He'll have stretches where you're shaking your head, where he cannot locate the baseball, and then he'll be a shutdown number one for a streak of 10 starts in a row, like he was last year with Cleveland leading them to the postseason. And you just hope if you're the Orioles, you can ride those good waves and you have enough to make up for the bad ones. But troubling, I expect him to be okay this year. I think he'll be the mixed bag we've seen. Hopefully they can hang around 500, get Manny back, and then uh, Jimenez gets hot and the team does as well. Yes? Charlie, I'd like I'm a sophomore. Um, I was wondering what you thought about Bass, Thayer, and Peters for um, the rest of the transfer from Maryland. Talking about Maryland losing three transfers yesterday, I was told it wasn't a surprise. Faust is disappointing because he grew up down the street and went to City, and he's kind of been a disappointment, I guess. But uh, that program right now heading to the Big Ten, they have a lot of issues. There's no question, and they have a lot of spots to fill now. But if you watch a lot of Maryland basketball last year, I don't think anyone is crying about losing those three guys per se. They all had their moments of struggles. Yes? Tyler, I'm a senior. Could you speak a little bit about the competition between other broadcasting companies like CBS, NBC, Fox? It's a great and question. How that affects you guys around? Well, there's very few locally owned radio stations anymore. There are a handful, but not many. And certainly, if you want to compete at the highest level, you need the backing. Usually, whether it's fortunately or unfortunately, of a major corporation. My company is owned by the Hearst Corporation, which is out of New York. They have hundreds of newspapers, magazines, and television stations, and they have many wings, and then um, they have only two radio stations, and they're both here in Baltimore, the two I work for, WBAL and 98 Rock, and I've worked at CBS in my life, I've worked at uh, Metro Networks, which was owned by Westwood One, another huge media conglomerate, uh, and it is, a, it is a tough business out there, and these companies expect to make money, their patience is very little, when they don't get the returns that they are investing in. A great example, just off the top of my head, the uh, late night wars that have gone on in television for 
uh, you know, a long time now, especially when CBS got involved. But you think about Conan O'Brien, who I still think is very funny. He was certainly when I was growing up. But uh, he's on TBS now. I think NBC gave him less than a year to host The Tonight Show. And I'm not saying it would have worked out, but less than a year. That is not a fair sample size. I'm very grateful for my station and my company because I think about the guy they hired when I was 25 years old in 2010, and I was pretty raw in those days. I, I, was, I will say that I think I hopefully I'm much better now. I'm still not nearly as good as I need to be, but thankfully they had a long-term vision and didn't react to my first five or 10 shows. It would have never gotten off the ground, but that's the way a lot of bosses look at that, and that's the way a lot of these companies look at it, especially in the tough slugging that's going on out there in sales and business, coming off of a recession, you know, every salesperson will tell you it's been a long winter, everything hurts, so the margin for error on the local level is very, very small. Again, not to bore everyone with some of the uh, physical components of this business, but these people who are calling the shots in New York and Los Angeles want a return, and they want it, they want it yesterday, really. So it's, it's very competitive. It's very competitive. <clears throat> yes, in the back. Nice from sophomore. Um, you said that in Gilman you were very interested in broadcasting a variety of sports. Did you have any special interest in a particular sport or playing a particular sport? Well, I mean, I love a lot of sports. I think my family would uh, agree with that. So to me, basketball was the first one. The reason we did basketball first, it happened to be winter, but with the, actually it came down to wiring in a gym and we were able to get a phone line installed and we had the outlets to do it. I mean, going outside to do lacrosse and baseball was very complex and it created a lot more, you need more money, you need more wires, you need more equipment. So basketball was actually done because it made the most technical sense. But I love calling games. I, I, I love it. It's something that, it's the one thing in my career right now I haven't had um, a lot of experience with. I've called Towson basketball, and this year actually started doing Loyola lacrosse on the Patriot League Network, which I absolutely love. Lacrosse is interesting, and I will say I kind of thought this way when I was 16 or 17 years old, that I thought the sport would hit television and radio more as I was getting older and advancing in my career, and I thought the competition for play-by-play -play jobs would be easier to navigate through. I literally thought that way when I was 15 or 16 years old. There just aren't that many people who grew up calling lacrosse games. So I saw it as an opportunity. It's actually proven to be correct. And the more these games are getting on TV and hitting the radio, I think because I did it when I was 16 or 17 years old, I have demos to prove it. And I did it in college. And I'm doing it now again. It really worked out uh, well for me. But I, I love calling all sports. And I would be open to calling anything uh, for a good game, no doubt about that. <coughs> yes? Hi, I'm Chase Campbell, I'm a senior, and uh, it seems like you do a pretty awesome job of <laughs> uh, growing up, you know, being born and raised in Baltimore, covering uh, mostly local sports. I was wondering if you ever had any aspirations to kind of go on a more national scale with your company, or since it's kind of a good job? Yeah, that's a great question. My, my boss didn't send you, did he? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know what my personal finish line is. I really don't. That's the honest answer to that question. I love my hometown. I absolutely love Baltimore. I love the fact that I worked down the street from where I went to high school and where I grew up. I think uh, there are a lot of great things that make this community very special. A place like Gilman for one. And uh, if my wife is from Baltimore. I'm from Baltimore. My parents are still here. I really see no reason to leave. I, I get to work in a building that gives me a lot of opportunities. I get to do television, radio, AM and FM, different things. It never gets old, three hour talk show. I do have an itch to do more play by play and I wouldn't rule out anything down the road. You never know. I can't guarantee my own future at WBAL. That's the other thing. And it's a very humbling business, a very humbling business. I have no guarantees moving forward that I will even be at WBAL beyond a couple of years from now. And even then, if I have a really bad show tonight, I can promise you they'll get rid of me tomorrow if I really have a bad show. But <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen. But uh, there's always going to be some intrigue beyond this community. I'm lucky. Most people who start off down this road in broadcasting or media, the traditional order, and I was keenly aware of this growing up, 
is you go small market, a little bigger, a little bigger, a little bigger. And Baltimore is a top three market with two major league sports teams, two big time sports teams, a lot of great collegiate institutions, which is such an opportunity for any sportscaster in the area, a niche, niche sports like horse racing and lacrosse, which I love. So um, it's a great community for me, but I was lucky out of college, my first job in broadcasting I graduated in May of 07. I got my first job in August of 07, and actually at the time, and I remember using my brother's apartment for this, I was burning every demo, labeling them, getting cover letters together, and I went through and scoured the internet for, and it's much easier now than it used to be, for every radio station in America, in let's say the 25 states I would agree to live in, that had a similar format to what I was looking for, news talk sports. And I was applying for jobs that the traffic, weather, and news, not sports. And that's another lesson here as well. But I was talking to program directors in upstate New England, upper, upper New England, I should say, I should say, excuse me, uh, small, small stations on the Eastern shore, New Mexico. I was talking to a program director in New Mexico and I was all ready to go. And I, if you can, you can't be in this business halfway. You have got to do it all the way and be prepared to go anywhere. And I sent a fake news demo. I never had done news in my life. Again, I don't have a communications degree. I'm a political science major. I don't have a journalism degree, although I did write for uh, school papers. And I think over time you learn about journalism as a craft, even if you don't have the uh, degree. But I sent a fake news demo to a program director for this company that's now not what it once was, called Metro Networks, which was out of downtown Baltimore at the time. And she called me up after she got my CD. Again, I really put together a news demo, which I had never done before, using one of those little uh, microphones they used to attach to computers. And I put it on a CD and I sent it to her when I saw a full-time job opening. And she calls me and goes, when can we meet? I go to this office building in downtown Baltimore, and she goes, you're hired. And I go, I'm hired for what? She goes, you'll be doing uh, beach traffic. <laughs> Next weekend, Sunday, people are coming home from the beach during the summer, it's August. You'll be doing beach traffic. And I, I remember my first report, I'm on a really rinky-dink radio station on the Eastern Shore, and they're like, go, here's your, your one minute, and here's the sponsor you're, you're going to read. And I go, okay, it looks like it's backed up on the Bay Bridge right now. <laughs> and, and that was my first professional broadcast. And then they eventually uh, hired me to do mornings, and I mean mornings, and I do a lot of mornings, uh, you know, four or five a.m., for, I was to do 40 reports a day in the morning and then I'd come back in the afternoon. And eventually I was hired uh, where I interned the previous summer at CBS to do sports updates in the middle of the day. So I'd go and get up at 4 a.m. and I'd go to downtown Baltimore and I'd do 40 traffic reports. Eventually I would do news and weather there as well. And then I'd go to CBS in Baltimore, which is off Falls Road down the street, and I'd do a couple of sports updates in the middle of the day. Then I went back to Metro to afternoon uh, traffic reports and then that's how my career got started. Eventually, I started doing more and more at the sports station. They gave me a weekend show, and then they gave me a contract, and then I was kind of the number one pinch hitter during the week for talk shows and had my weekend show. And then one day, and this is the luck, and there's so much luck in this business, uh, but, and in life in general, I would say, some things you cannot control. But one day, my current program director, who, and I interned there 50, uh, 10 years earlier, he hears me doing a Ravens playoff post game. This is after the 08 playoffs when they upset the Titans in Nashville. And actually WBA, WBA all the time, which is, was the flagship and is the flagship where I work now, they had to air these national NFL playoff broadcasts. So they had no calling post game show, which we would never do now, thankfully. But they had no calling post game show. But at the time, I was the only post game show in town after the Ravens had won. And I was on until like two o'clock in the morning it was one of the best nights of broadcasting in my life. The stars kind of aligned. I think I lost time. I blacked out, and it was just one of my greatest nights in the history of radio. And my current program director happened to be listening that night because my station now didn't have a postgame show that night. He calls me at like 3 o'clock in the morning and says, we need to talk. And then um, I was under contract at the time, so that's a whole other story. But eventually I was able to get across the street and come to where I am now. But uh, these are the things. It, it's... It's always this ladder you're climbing, but if I spent every day of my career in Baltimore, I would be perfectly content with that. I really love Baltimore, and I, 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 I wouldn't care, I guess, to make a very uh, 
long answer to a very uh, simple uh, question. I don't, I wouldn't care about covering the Kansas City Royals or the St. Louis Rams like I do talking about the Orioles and Ravens. It, does, it just doesn't resonate with me. These are the teams I grew up cheering for. These are the teams I care about. What about the Packers and the Brewers? That's another good question, Dr. Thornberry. <laughs> Brian Braun did have three home runs yesterday. One more question. Anyone in the back? Yes, here in the front. Yes. I had a wonderful experience there, and if anyone's thinking about Dickinson, I'd be happy to talk with them privately or email me. Um, it was perfect for me. Easy transition from the side of this school, what, 85 miles away from home or so. Coming from Baltimore and living in the city and really spending almost <laughs> every day of my life in the city, uh, but uh, going to a small town like that was a nice change of pace. I really grew to admire small town America. And for me, academically, having that hands-on approach with the teachers like I was used to and the professors there was great. It was right up my alley, having very strong political science and history departments. I had wonderful friends there from all over. And I did not get to, again, major communications and journalism, which if you want to go down this road professionally, I'm not saying that's not the right or wrong way to go. If you were interested in going to Newhouse and you can get into Newhouse, that is a great way at Syracuse to go about your career path because that's a wonderful opportunity. What you get at Dickinson and a place like Dickinson, even if you cannot go to one of the elite communication or journalism schools like they have in College Park, one of the best in the country, what you get at Dickinson is an opportunity to continue how to develop as a learner and a thinker. And the countless research papers that I did at Dickinson is almost exactly what I do right now for three hours a night, and how to think on your feet and how to debate. So for me, it was personally great. As far as broadcasting is concerned, if you go to a Syracuse, and I've talked to a lot of people who have gone that route, and listen, you watch ESPN, almost every other person you see on television went to Syracuse. But you might get to call one game or two games in four years. I got to call football, basketball, baseball across year round at Dickinson, and I created my own game notes. I created my own style of broadcasting. So you're really put out there to sink or swim, and that to me was invaluable in the overall experience of going where I've gone with my career professionally. All right, I'm, I'm gonna have to stop. Uh, Fred, you better stick around. Okay. All right.